8. If you are new here, we welcome you to the 8. The 8 is our second service here at St. Mark Church. And we are in part two of a series titled, Elijah Rock. I have to say, you have to sing it. And I'm, I'm not going to sing it two weeks in a row. But this is a song, it's based, like the name is called Elijah Rock because it's based off a, a, a song from 1860s of which African-American slaves would sing this song to get them through the pain and turmoil of slavery, and, and, and they would hold on to the song. This was a big high song for me when I was in high school chorus, so that's why I like the song uh, Elijah Rock. But we're talking about a historical figure by the name of Elijah, obviously. He is in the 9th century BC. There has to be something appealing at about a historical figure which captivated the Jews, is an integral figure, obviously, in Christianity and even in Islam. There's something about this figure of, of, of Elijah that has captivated so many people throughout the centuries. And actually, even if you look at the, 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 all the New Testament scriptures, all the records we have of Jesus' life and in the first few decades of Christianity, there is no other prophet mentioned more in the New Testament besides Elijah. So why did these early people who decided to follow Jesus in the first century, why did they write so much, or they mentioned Elijah more than any other Old Testament prophet? There are tons of other prophets they could have mentioned, but why did they end up describing or elaborating about Elijah? There's something appealing about the character and spirit of Elijah that has captivated so many people throughout the centuries. And this is why we're doing a five-week series and life group of discussing who is Elijah and what does that mean to you and me? So last week we talked about how God's chosen people, the Israelites, everything was fine and dandy for them. From the year 1250 BC or around that time, everything was great. They were out of slavery. They were, they were living life in the promised land. Everything was hunky-dory. Everything was great. They were on cloud nine. Then all of a sudden, different kings started to say, you know what? It's cool worshiping God, but I want to do me. And maybe some other people want to do other things. So you don't, you don't have to worship God. There, maybe there's other ways to do life besides following God. So people began to have different versions of their own ethics, different versions of morality. They started to do what they felt is right. And there began to be a drift, one generation after another after another. And I hope, for those who signed up for Life Group, I hope this week that you guys elaborated on something called generational habits, in which what you and I do Maybe our tendencies, our habits, our mindset is molded by what we were exposed to growing up. Or maybe we're still exposed to it and it's still molding us. And we will naturally carry on the good and the bad to the next generation. And this is exactly what happened. So one king after another, one king said, you know, worshiping God is good, but maybe like somebody else can do something else. It got to a, like a, all time low with a person named King Ahab. And like, just to show you, like, here's like the division. Like, I'm, I'm obviously we're not gonna have a geography class right here, but there is a division in, 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 in God's chosen people. And there was so much division because like one bad king led to a badder king, led to a baddest king, and it just got worse. Obviously, and this is no real English, but you know what I'm saying. It just got really, 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 really bad. And then here comes a prophet who is a messenger from God to try to open the eyes of God's people. From around the year, from the, from the third century AD till now, the early church understood how important prophets were of them being the, 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 the vessel or the channel in which God would speak. And this is something that we pray liturgically in our ancient prayers. St. Basil said this in the year 350 AD. You have always visited us through your holy prophets. We say, God, you have always visited humanity. You have always visited us. You have sent good judges. You have sent prophets. You have sent good kings. You have sent these people to try to redeem us, to restore us, for us to open our eyes to who we are and how we can worship God, how we can connect with God. You have always visited us. But <laughs> they reached a point where we still aren't getting the message. You have always visited us through your holy prophets. And in the last days, you completely manifested yourself to us, God. You decided to roll up your sleeve and you put on a bod and you completely, through your incarnation, revealed to humanity how we are designed to live. You came to show us the fullness of life by you coming down yourself. You have visited us, but you reached a point that you said, you know what, there's a day for me to manifest myself 
That is Christmas. That is Jesus. Darkness, relativity came through the kings. So, yeah, through the kings. And it ultimately led to a really, really bad king by the name of King Ahab. Now comes a prophet by the name of Elijah. Okay, Rock is not his last name, by the way. That's just the song. So it's Elijah. So Elijah comes, and he is now, like, he has been empowered by God to try to fix all this mess that has happened over the generations. So what does Elijah do? Now Elijah, the Tishbite, from Tishbe in Gilead, came to Ahab, King Ahab, and he said this, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Boom. He drops the mic. Elijah says, okay, fine. Everything up to now, you've been doing it your way. Right now, I know who I am. I know who I belong to. I know what I have been called to do. And I'm here to deliver truth. No more relativity. No more your own version of ethics. No more your version of morality. That's done. From this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit where it hurts. I'm just a vessel that God has, has equipped me to be a vessel to you, to be a vessel to humanity. But from this point, enough is enough. I'm going to hit where it hurts. I'm going to hit the economy where there's no more rain. You and I read this, it sparks zero emotion. Why? Because if we, if we say there's no rain for the next week, you would be thrilled. You, you and I would be happy, right? So it doesn't, doesn't mean anything to us. But back then, for Elisha to say that this is equivalent, or Elisha to come right now and say, I'm going to crash the stock market, and it's going to, like, I don't want to mean to stress anybody out, but I'm saying that's equivalent. I'm saying I'm going to hit it where it hurts. The economy is going to crash. This is exactly what, econ this is exactly what Elisha said. He said, I'm not going to make it rain. Take the internet away. Yeah, that's, uh, maybe, that, maybe that really stresses us out, right? So here's Elijah saying, we're taking the internet away. We're taking rain away. Agriculture, everything, food, everything is going to be affected by this. Imagine now. I want you to picture for a second. You're Elijah. You've just been empowered by God. You came to the most powerful man in the country. You came to King Ahab. No more, your majesty, this, and I, I, I have a message I need to share to God about, uh, I need to, if I can have some of your time. No, he came in, he said, I know who I am, I am here before God Almighty, whom I serve, and I'm here to deliver this message. And boom, he probably walked away, dropped the mic, and just probably walked away with his chest out a little bit more than when he walked in. Imagine you felt like this. And then imagine the next thing that God reveals to you and speaks to you is this. Thank you, Elijah. Good job. Thank you for delivering that word to King Ahab. But I need you to leave here. I need you to turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. Excuse me. I'm sure Elijah was probably thinking, or at least if I was Elijah. God, we're doing amazing things right now. What are you talking about? We're about to flip this country upside down, man. Did you see that? I said no rain and no rain. What you, now you tell me to go hide? You tell me to leave? What in the world? God, we're just getting started. I'm here. I'm your son. I'm, we're about to, come on. Like, we have this great partnership. You tell me what to do when I tell them they're listening and everything's happening. Well, actually, what you said. So what do you mean for me to leave? Why are you wanting me to leave when everything is going so smooth and so great right now? Come on. And here's God telling him, leave and turn eastward and hide. <laughs> Not just, shoo, don't go away, Elijah. No, leave and hide. Why on earth would God want to stop such an amazing thing? Why would God say, that's enough, and I need you to leave, and I want you to hide? Logically, it makes zero sense, especially now God's power is working through Elijah. And now there's finally, after so many generations, there is final change happening in the kingdom, in which King Ahab, somebody spoke up to him, and somebody gave it to him. And now God is telling Elijah, chill, and you need to have a seat. God's priority for you and me is to not to fix a problem, but God's priority is to fix you and me. God's priority for Elijah is not to fix the, the issue happening in the kingdom. God's priority is to fix Elijah. God, and put it another way, God's priority is consecration, then healing. God needed to pull Elijah aside and says, you know, I'm God. I know what I'm doing. 
I could fix this by snap of a finger. And, I'm, and you and I, we're going to do great things. But my, my, my focus, my priority, is not the issues in the economy, not the morality. No, my focus is you, is your soul, is you and me. This is my priority. God's priority is consecration, then healing. What's the word consecration, bro? It seems like a very churchy word. You probably don't really hear it outside of a church setting. What's the word consecration mean? If you break it down, the etymology in Latin, it's coming from two things. Com and then, I'm not going to pronounce this right, sacrare. So, so they're, they're coming from two things. Like calm means like for something to, be, to come together. Sacrare or sacred, that means it's something I'm setting it apart, I'm making it holy, I'm making it whole. So how are you making something whole? Rewind. Everything, everything, everything was made to be good. Everything, everything was made to be divine. Everything was made to reflect the divinity of God to reflect his majesty, everything. And now w w the, the mission in which God is trying to prioritize is take what is broken and restore it for it to be whole, restore it to be sacred, restore it for it to be taken away from brokenness and for it to go back to its original estate, which is wholeness, which is divine. So God's priority is consecration, then healing, then fixing the issue of what's going on in the kingdom. But God's priority is fixing Elijah. God's priority is not your issue that you always come to God with and, and you're saying, God, really fix this in my house, in my, my marriage, and my kids. God cares about that, and his heart breaks just as your heart breaks. But his priority is not the issue. His priority is consecrating you and me. The beauty of the ancient church is that we take consecration very, very serious. The mission of the church is to take what is broken and to make it whole. I mean, that's the mission of Jesus. So now his body is, 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 is continuing that same mission of taking what is distorted and for it to be made whole. This is why if you look in the liturgical prayers of the church, especially if you look in the Coptic Reader app, for those who have it, which the app just lists all the liturgical prayers of the church. And if you open consecrations, this is the list of things in which there are formal liturgical services in which we consecrate people and items. Why? What's the big deal? Why can't we just, like, use a, a, an altar? Why can't I just say, this is an altar? And we're, why can't I say that? Why can't I just take a censer that I buy from China and say we're going to use it in church? Why? What's the big, like, why is the church making a big deal about consecrations? The church is saying, these items, this metal, this wood, this plastic, whatever, now it's, now it's going to be used for God. It's going to be set apart. Now it's not just wood. Now it's not just metal. Now it's not just a sensor. Now it's not just a person. Now this is my pure vessel to make a generational impact in this temporal world. The church is setting that person aside. That person is wanting to make that, make that person whole or make that item whole. So the, the list is endless. Consecrating a church for us to say, no, the church is not just a building of four walls. <laughs> we know that very well here at St. Mark Church, right? He's saying, no, the church is the hospital in which we come as patients to find remedy from him, the true physician. No, we say the altar is not just a, 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 a table. No, we're saying this is the intersection of us with God. This is where something that transcends logic occurs. The, the vessels, the sensors, the icons, we're saying, no, this is not just some... Uh, board or painting. No, this is a window into heaven. A baptistry. No, we're not saying this is just a metal tub. No, we're saying, no, this is where death and resurrection occurs sacramentally. No, this will be a cornerstone, the building of a church. We're saying, no, what, what, what's being established here? And I pray to God we celebrate this one day for St. Mark Church. But when we come together, we're laying a cornerstone in the church. And we're saying, no, this is not just a building. This is not just brick. We are, we are being a light to the city of Atlanta. Please, God. So this is what we're, this is what we're praying when we have this, these prayers. That's a cornerstone. Oil. I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to bore you. But the, this, is, this is the theology the, of the fullness of the church throughout the centuries of why consecration is a big deal. There's someone else who is consecrated. You and me. For us to be set apart. For us to be made whole. You know what's a common term used in all these prayers? A Greek term? Is, anybody want to pronounce it? Agios. Why? Like, why is the church, and actually sometimes it's not even translated in English. In English, it would be holy, but it doesn't do it justice. 
The church says agios for these liturgical prayers. Why? Let's take the etymology of the word agios. There's a prefix and a suffix. The prefix of agios would be a, and, and the suffix would be geos. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Just make sure you're with me. So agios. So the prefix a means like the negation of something, right? So a whatever like means the, the opposite negation. What's an example of that? Um, Asymptomatic, very good. Like, so, so symptoms, if you don't have symptoms, you're asymptomatic, okay? So ge geos is earth or world. Like geology is like the study of the world or the earth, right? So, or geography. Yeah, ge so, so, so geos would be like the earth. So when we're saying agios, we're saying this item, this sensor, this baptistry, this person is not of this world. Are you with me? We're saying this person is holy. This person is not of this world. Just as we say God is holy, Ageus, he is not of this world. You and I are the same. If we come from him, if we are made in his image and likeness, if we are called to be his light to this world, we are not of this world. The brokenness, the distortion, our ego, our pride, our lust, pull us away from our divine design. And this is the struggle. This is the battlefield you and I go through every single day. But our original divine design is to be made whole, is to be agios, to be made whole, holy, because we are not of this world. I love that. Going back, God tells him, when everything's on a high note, Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan. You see how God beautifully works? You know what the word kareth, ravine? You know, if you, if you look up the Hebrew, you know what it really means? Amputate, be cut off. So, so God is, t is telling Elijah, yes, I want you to go to kareth, ravine, but actually I want you to be cut off. And he's using these play on words, saying I want you to go to this designated place, but I need you to be cut off. My priority is consecrating you then we'll worry about the world. Then we'll worry about the kingdom. Then we'll worry about King Ahab and his wife. We'll get there. We'll get there. But my priority is not that. My priority is you. Because I'm wanting to consecrate you. I'm wanting to make sure that you are not of this world. I want you to see that. I want you to see yourself in the same way I see you, Elijah. And your Heavenly Father is telling you and me the same thing today. That I want you to see yourself the same way God sees you. That you are not of this world. This is why you and I try to find things to make us feel good or try to lift us up through our pain and struggle. But we still feel empty. We're still missing something. Why? Because by divine design, we are not of this world. God tells him this, next verse. You will drink, Elijah, you will drink from the brook. And I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Last time I checked... Like, ravens are not like these cute little animals. Oh, it's a cute raven. You give me some food. No, like, they're intimidating, right? That's, that's why, like, a football team is titled the Baltimore Ravens, okay? They're, they're not, like, they're not cute, gentle little, like, birds. So here is God using, like, something that doesn't make logical sense. So God is saying, consecrate yourself. Separate yourself. Know that you are not of this world. And then watch what I will do through you. This is, God is challenging. Watch what I will do through you. But I first need you to set yourself apart. And I'm sure Elijah, if I was Elijah, I'd be biting my tongue. But God, we're just doing so great. Can we just wait till next week? Like, why? Well, why didn't you do this before? Why? God said, chill, I got you. I need you to be set apart first. I need you to have clarity of knowing you're not of this world. I need, you to, I need to consecrate you. I need you to be amputated from the noise of this world in order for me to work through you. I need to consecrate you. Then we'll get to all that. When we set ourselves apart, this is where God works. When we set ourselves apart, this is where, not literally, raven will feed you. This is where God will work in a way beyond our comprehension. But first, we have to say, I'm all in. We first have to surrender, saying, I got you, God. I'm all in. Where, where do I need to set myself apart? Where, what part of my life needs to be consecrated? What aspect of who I am needs to be made whole? Then from there, this, then from there will come healing. Then will come ravens feeding you. God's saying, surrender to me. Set yourself up, apart. Then see what I will do through you and in you. God is challenging Elijah to take this step. 
God is prepping Elijah by detaching him from the noise and just ministry as a whole. And for those who serve in any capacity, it's easy, including myself, it's easy to get lost in ministry and, not, and, and lose sight of our soul, that I need to set myself up. Parents, it's easy to just sit there and like, I need to do this, I need to do that, and we, we lose sight, but we never consecrate ourselves. We never set time apart of us being alone. One thing I want for those who sign up for Life Group, I want you to discuss this this week. What is the difference between solitude and loneliness? We think, we hear about Elijah, like, man, that's probably super lonely, like, to be, like, next to, like, a body of river, like, by yourself, like, that's super lonely and no internet, <laughs> like, that's, that really stinks. We, we need to differentiate between these two words. What is loneliness and what is solitude? We struggle, if we're honest, with our fast-paced world of scrolling and next and filling up our calendar. We lose sight of what is solitude. We can't stand loneliness. We can't stand it. And we've all been there. We've all been there. But I want us to keep sight and have clarity on what is solitude. Let that be the focus, because this is what God is pushing Elijah to experience. I started to think, like, what does the Coptic Orthodox Church say about Elijah? Through the hymnology, through the art of the church. What, is the, uh, what, what aspect of Elijah does the Alexandrian Church capture about Elijah? And I, in, this, in the hymn, stuck out to me. We say this in the morning doxologies, a hymn in the church. We say, hail to Elijah, the prophet of temperance, and Elisha, his elect disciple. We'll get to Elisha in a few weeks here. But, but we're saying we are honoring Elijah, the prophet of, like the church could have said any other word. It said the prophet of, I got you, prophet of zeal, passion, guts, confidence, any other word. Why does the church say he's the prophet of temperance? You know what temperance is? You're able to abstain yourself. You're able to restrain yourself. You're able to have self-control. That's what the virtue of temperance is. So here's Elijah. I'm sure he's biting his tongue. of saying, man, why, why do I got to go to the ravine? What are you doing, God? But God is setting him apart in his patience of surrendering to God and setting himself apart for him to be reminded of how holy he is. It's because of that virtue of temperance. This is why the church honors him. And this is why we, 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 we sing it. I, I love this hymn. Actually, it's one of my favorite hymns. Because it's like, it's like a 10, 15 minute hymn, but it's like this like upbeat, jumpy tune, like with the symbols, you know, you know, it goes like this. Hail to Elijah, the prophet of temperance, and Elisha, his elect disciple. It's bouncy. I like it. Like it's so, uh, yeah, so that's, that, that, that's, that's why we're honoring Elijah. But it, I was always wondering, why, why temperance? Why not any other virtue? For 18 long months, for 18 long months, Elijah is sitting by the ravine, hiding, obeying God, being fed by ravens, which all, all this is beyond logic. And this is where God is equipping him to make a huge impact in this world. Real power with God comes from solitude, not loneliness, not I need to do this, I need to do that. Real power from God comes from solitude. With solitude comes consecration. With consecration comes the reminder of, of how we are intended to be holy. With holiness comes an impact to this world. But it has to begin. We want to jump into the, believe me, <laughs> the thing that was running through this personally, because I, 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 what is, I'm saying this is what applies to me. I'm not sure about you. This is for you to digest. This is how I felt, if I had a glimpse of how Elisha felt, this is how I felt when after my ordination as a priest, spending 40 days in the monastery. Because you're getting ordained, you have like all these big dreams of what you want to do in ministry, all these big things you want to do. And all of a sudden, the church says, congratulations, peace, we'll see you in 40 days. And here's the flight, uh, you know, and, and bon voyage, enjoy your 40 days. That's what the church said. And I'm like, ah, like I, I want to do this, I can't wait to see that. And I, I, you, you're just, you're so thrilled of what you want God to do through you. And now the church says, chill, you need 40 days of consecration. What is that for you and me? Forget 40 days. Forget 40 minutes. Do you consecrate a period of time every day of solitude, of solitude, to remind you of your consecration, for you to remind yourself, just as God is not of this earth, of this world, he made you and me not to be of this world. 
I want you to assess. Please do not answer out loud. When you are like on cloud nine, you got the best news ever. When things cannot get any worse, when you're at such a low point through pain, through grief, through agony, through stress, through anxiety, what do you do and where do you go? What do you do and where do you go? I can't use my phone right now, it's right there, but. We end up pulling out our phone, scrolling away, Candy Crush. I don't know if anybody plays that anymore, but whatever. We do something on our phone. We watch, we get lost in a movie, in a video, on YouTube. Where do you go when things either on cloud nine or when there's tremendous pain? Forget the phone. It might be alcohol, it might be drugs, it might be porn, it might be some type of sexual addiction. We go somewhere when we're in that low point. What if we consecrated a place and where you live? You consecrated a time of the day in which it's you and God by the ravine and see what he feeds you. Accept God's challenge. If the same God who's working now is the same God who challenged Elijah to consecrate himself, challenge him, accept his challenge. See what he will do through you and me. If we consecrate, pause, chill, put the phone away, silence, and connect with God in solitude, see what he will do through you and me. For those who, are, who signed up for Life Group, I want to share with you some of the questions you'll be discussing this week. For those who did not sign up for a life group, you better make sure you do that next time for the next season of life group. But I want to share with you some questions for you and I to digest this week. Have you ever experienced what Elijah went through where everything is going in the right direction and then boom, you get hit by a wall? Have you ever experienced that? Everything is going smooth. And then all of a sudden, why God, everything was going good. Why did you, why did that, why did you allow that to happen? Question number two. We have all experienced loneliness at some point. What differentiates loneliness from solitude? Question number three. Many early Christians view solitude as a catalyst for personal growth. Do you agree? Why or why not? Like, do you see solitude being an integral part to our edification? Or you see it as like something nice that works for some people, works for others? Last question I'll throw up. Oh, sorry, the second last question. What does solitude look like in your life? What does that look like for you? Maybe we have like this picture of what it should look like. But I'm saying for you personally, your personality, how you are wired, what does that look like for you? Question number five. What is one thing you wish you could consecrate but just can't for one reason or another? What is one thing you wish you could consecrate but just can't for one reason or another? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's what you do with your finances. Maybe it is your finances. What is that one thing that you feel an itch that you need to consecrate to God? Accept God's challenge. I challenge you to accept God's challenge just as Elijah did and see what he will do through you. Let's stand for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, all of us are surrounded by so many things to do, places to go, of just always being on the go, of tasks. And Lord, I know that we have these responsibilities, but we also know that you have called us for something so much bigger. You have called us to set us apart so that we can be fruitful in our tasks, that we can make an impact and be fruitful in our, in our responsibilities. Lord, your responsibility is not, or your priority, I should say, is not just getting things done or for this to work out in our life. No, your priority is our soul. Your priority is us, your children. Your priority is for us to see how much we are loved by you. Your priority is for us to see how much we are accepted by you. Your priority is for us to know how we are holy. 
Lord, I pray that this is in front of us, that this is in our heart. It is not our past. It is not our weakness. It is not our struggle that defines us. What defines us is our consecration to you, us being set apart from our sins, us being set apart from our responsibilities, us being set apart from our pain, but for us to know that we are holy. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit renews within us, convicts us to take steps in our life groups this week, and maybe in just for us, you know, digesting today's talk, for us to know that we are called to be set apart in this world. Through the prayers of all your saints, Lord, hear us as we all pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, guys. We will do part three next Sunday.